um, the World Voice, um, excuse me, Penn World Voices Festival with you tonight. Um, we do about 90 shows a year, so we do hope that after tonight you will be coming back to the space. Um, next week we uh, kick off our round of events again. Um, Q2 Music Presents Bang on a Can All Stars field recording album release on uh, Wednesday, May 13th. And then following that show, we will have the Macropolis series, where we will be talking about race, poverty, and policy on Thursday, May 14th. Now, if you are interested in any of these shows um, or other things that we present here, um, tickets are uh, available for these shows um, and many more um, at thegreenspace.org, and that is uh, green with two E's, so G-R-E-E-N-E. Um, space.org. Um, you can be the first to know of all the things that happen in this space by joining our newsletter, um, by liking us on Facebook, and, and also joining us um, on Twitter. Now, um, this is the time that I will be uh, asking you to be mindful about your electronics. Uh, so if you have cell phones, please do put them on silent. Um, you don't have to turn them off because we would also ask um, you to join us on Twitter if you'd like, um, at the Green Space. <laughs> um, and if you are taking any photography tonight, um, please do not use Splash. Um, now, we are live streaming tonight's event, so um, if you would like to go back um, and watch this, it will be living on our website on demand, so you can watch the video again, share it with your friends, your family, your foes, whoever you like. Um, <laughs> please do share. <laughs> it lives on the website forever. Um, and I think that covers all of that. Now, um, I am very, very happy to present um, Kim Chan, the General Manager of the Penn Festival. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kim, and I just wanted to thank everyone to, for coming. You have on your chairs the festival brochure. We're at the beginning of a really exciting week of all sorts of events and discussions, and I know after tonight you're going to want to come back, so I hope to see you again, and enjoy this evening. Thank you. teach at the University of the Bitfalters Rund. Um, and on behalf of the writers, the translators, and the editors of PEN, uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome all of you here uh, to the 11th Annual PEN World Voices Festival of International Literature. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the sponsors, uh, the supporters, and the volunteers of the festival, without whose support of course, this uh, entire event would not be possible. Um, this festival, as you know, brings together writers from across the globe to explore uh, timely subjects of our time, of our day in art, politics, and personal life. Uh, and for the first time this year, uh, Penn is, fo is focusing on a region, and it's a great delight for us that it is Africa that is being focused on an area uh, of the world that for some people uh, was without history and remains seen to be a continent mired particularly around these issues of queerness to be mired in some kind of uh, backward set of cultures and I hope tonight we can explore the ways in which those of us who live on the continent experience it very differently uh, and experience it as a place of great creative energy and great possibility. So I hope that this evening's uh, discussion will uh, open up questions uh, about personal and intimate life, about the choices that we are able to make, uh, all of us in uh, all parts of the world, not just uh, Africa, but in particular, I think, uh, the set of challenges uh, that's a very South African word, the set, set of challenges that we face in South Africa. We have a great panel uh, beginning uh, on that end with uh, Benyama Gawinana, who is a writer and uh, does not want to be called an activist, he says. He is a writer from Kenya. Uh, Benyamanga is uh, 
uh, has spent time on many different in many different countries on our continent, uh, as well as time as director of the Bard Center, uh, the Chinua Achebe Center for African Writers. Uh, next to him, Zaneli Moholi, uh, one of Africa's most famous photographers now. I would say rapidly becoming a voice next to someone like William Kentridge as one of the greatest artists uh, produced by South Africa. Uh, Zanelli's photography at the moment is on uh, show at uh, the Brooklyn Museum uh, and I would urge you all to, to go and see it. She also has this book, Phases and Faces, which is shortlisted uh, currently for a prize. And then right next to me from Nigeria, um, Kahinde Badamozi, who is a, also a writer, a blogger, a PR man, I think, and the son of a preacher, he says, <laughs> uh, who is currently uh, finishing his memoir on growing up as a preacher's boy uh, in Nigeria uh, and the kinds of uh, uh, difficulties that he's faced. Um, so a, a panel of homies from South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, people who I think are uh, at the cutting edge of a lot of thinking about queerness in Africa, a really fitting panel uh, to talk about queer futures. So I want to open up this conversation uh, by talking about uh, the project of publicity. Uh, the idea that speaking out about our sexualities in the public sphere is politically necessary uh, in our time. This is an interesting question for us in the African context because it takes us into a new phase of politics that is different uh, from the era when silence itself was seen as strategic. Sylvia Tamale, who is uh, somebody you may all have heard of, a lawyer, an academic, uh, the leading force behind uh, stopping the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda, she's argued in her work that silence uh, can, can be as empowering as speech, uh, and in fact is a, a mode of empowerment that's particularly African, she says, around issues of sexuality. Um, it is, uh, she says, it is this powerful uh, political mode because it constitutes a refusal to talk about black sexualities on the terms of colonialism. Um, so she's always argued for thinking differently about silence. But it seems to me that now we are in a bit of a different mode. And I wondered how you would respond uh, to the idea that there's much more uh, uh, self-confident engagement of publics. Uh, not just the publics in which we feel safe, but also the publics in which we feel unsafe uh, on the continent, and that in, in a way each of you have been at the cutting edge of engaging the public sphere. Uh, Zaneli, you've long been uh, involved in the project of visibility, and photography of course lends itself as a medium to that uh, project. And you said in the past that silence is not an option for you, that speaking out uh, about crimes against particularly black queer women in South Africa uh, hurts you, but that that you would rather die knowing that you you spoke out than remain in silence. Uh, Binya Vanga, you have written in that wonderful uh, cultural magazine Chimurenga, something people should uh, look at. Uh, in Chimurenga, you you uh, named yourself as a homosexual. Uh, you made it uh, that powerful essay that went viral across our continent, uh, touched many lives, it sort of opened up a conversation that hadn't, uh, I think, been easy, easy for many young people before. And Kahinde, you too, in your social media platform, um, are, aimed at, are aiming at creating conversations about gay rights uh, in spaces that are difficult for many people. So I wonder if you could perhaps begin to uh, address this question of, of the way in which uh, African publics are now much more uh, engaged with questions of sexuality. Uh, does visibility, uh, do you think, marshal political power uh, in ways that it didn't before? Um, have we dented this perception uh, that 
it's only among African elites that you can talk about sexualities. Um, I think that is a perception. It's not being true. We know that living on the continent, that it has been talked about. We know it has been. But does this new project of uh, engaging publics through uh, new media, through photography, through writing, uh, change the political space? Binyanga, um, start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Africa is a big and complicated continent. Um, uh, I would say one of the most one of the most refreshing things because, like, I feel sometimes as a person, like I'm 16 years old, it took me like until my 30s to to to, to even engage with myself about it, um, and now you go to club balconies in Nairobi, where, you know, queers have started to negotiate their, their, you know, their own terms of engagement. There was a club which was fairly open in town, downtown, where a lot of classes mix, you know, um, in Nairobi. And uh, so one time the owner decided to ban gays. He's like, we are, you, all you gay people are causing trouble here. And so Grace boycotted the club, and it shut down. Good. And he came begging, and it shut down. <laughs> so somewhere in the club scene of town, mm -hmm. the world must have gone around that uh, this is not good for that business. And so you now have these balconies, which are queer. And the tendencies of younger generations are really, I find it really fascinating in Nairobi because um, if there was the time you had this really controlled upper middle class spaces where there were so many expatriates and they could have a side kind of a queer night, and because you have a lot of white people jumping inside that queer night, you could come it up to some degree, no kissing, and then other queers could come in and fit in there and from the wrong side of town, and, and no, nobody would bother you because Kenya remains very dedicated to making sure tourists and expatriates are very well taken care of, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a particular club, uh, because we are still alive, I'm like, let me not say the name. There's a club, um, and you know, it's the blurring of gay and straight has just happened. So, mostly inside, close to the bar, is mostly straight, kind of. But then, like, it's like, oh, and you're like, what are all those people up to there? And then the sort of sports bar watching people seem completely bothered about what's going on there, but they have to go outside to the balcony to smoke, which is uh, as queer in every diverse way you can imagine, uh, and not shy about not just kissing or everything and anything that you can imagine. Now. Um, and it's fine. Um, so for me, what, what I found in the last 10 years, what I've just found uh, remarkable, and talk less about, for now, about policies and laws and whatever, which you know, is, is very well you know, and articulated and, and all these things that one works for, is how the spaces from below, they themselves are sort of finding firm ground and planting their feet inside in ways and with this that can't really be easily undone. Um, um, I met this, this, this young man sent me a text message about four years ago, and he's like, oh, I'm coming to your town. And he said, I'm coming to your town. And so we, we, he texts me and we meet. So he's like, listen, uh, I come from a village about 50 kilometers away from Eldoret in a sort of area that is known to be quite homophobic or, or that the reactions will be a bit extreme to what, any mention of the word that one sex and another sex did, ever did anything to each other. And so he's like, so I'm like, so how did you... He's like, I didn't even know that there was a thing called homosexuality and everything else, but I really liked fat men. <laughs> like the headmaster, and, and, and I didn't know what to do with that information. And so, and so, <laughs> and, and so I ended up, he ended up in Eldoret, which is a near big town, and he was there, and he went online. And he didn't know all these usual social media and websites that many Africans know. He was like, I didn't even know that. So he kept, going, kept hitting paywalls. And he told, 
put your credit card details here, and he's like, he couldn't figure it out. Anyway, long and short is um, that somehow, uh, I call it the bright digital light. It, it has its own problems with what it brings, the bright digital light. Uh, manages to find people to find their micro communities in so many intense and specific ways that give you that security, I think to some degree has already fully happened. Um, which maybe one can call coming out <laughs> of visibility, you know. But that last 10 step that you would never take and say, you know, I'm leaving here or I'm reaching out and sending a, a message or an awkward thing to that person and I've diligently searched, pre-researched, twirled around that person because that's usually what happens is that people go peeping in your Facebook and then they're peeping around and everything else and then they send a message going, hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so things like that, yeah, yeah. So that, I think that, that the, the, my point about it is that on a, on the level of 10 years ago where these things were meeting at a head and the nation was in the capital and it was being argued in Kampala or Lagos or whatever, this sort of, um, in a continent that is innately so diverse, and diverse, I, I want to say, not New York diverse, upon which many, many different colors and types and textures of people meet on a common subway of arrangements, you understand? <laughs> I'm talking about where the subway of arrangements that these people who are, there are 46 who speak that language. There are those ones who are 25 million who speak that language. And then they're all squashed into a nation state. And then there are people who speak multiple like this across that kind of diversity where even the platforms that carry you are not. There's something in the idea of emergence and Africanness which these sorts of micro technologies suit almost better than anywhere at any time in history. And I think, I think it's really exciting that that's where these things get picked up in mm. this way so well. Yeah. But it's also interesting, though, what you say about the bright light of visibility, that in, in some parts uh, of Africa we've experienced that as, as positively enabling, and I'll come to that in a minute, Sarene, in terms of uh, some of the experiences in South Africa. But uh, in others, as in Uganda, the bright light of visibility is that public sphere of the law was used, in fact, to regulate us in ways that were repressive, and that without the law, in fact, people existed in much safer spaces than when attempts to create laws uh, were, were begun, right, in the last 10 years under the supposed banner of democracy. Um, so I think that's something we could we could explore the notion of publicity and the extent to which uh, it is as liberating as we sometimes imagine it to be. Um, but Zanelli, you, you've worked uh, precisely to bring to awareness uh, how having laws in place uh, is not enough to protect people from hate crimes. Um, I wonder if you could say something about your work and the work of photography uh, around this visibilizing uh, of certain sexualities in the public sphere. Um, sometimes visibility is good, but also at the same time visibility can be risky for many people, uh, especially in the townships where most of us grew up and also from spaces where you think that you protected the most, you find that a lot of people have been hurt and other people were, were murdered simply because of being in, in different spaces. We have took you know, visibility to the streets of Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town, we marched, we held placards, we made sure that you know, our government heard our voices and we needed to be attended to, you know, as a matter of fact. But, um, I realized that that was not the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. Other people understood mm -hmm. by using different uh, visual codes in which one had to speak, you know, on. So I just used visual activism as a means of speaking my truths and those who were around me. And in my headspace as I did that, I thought, uh, speaking of Africa or speaking of South Africa, we're speaking of visibility in terms of languages because we can't just assume 
that uh, visibility comes as English as how it's challenged by our leaders when they said it's an African to be queer because we don't have language for it. Speaking as a Zulu person and thinking of the number of languages that are spoken in our countries from Kenya to South Africa, we have 11 official languages. So how then do you make sure that everybody understands without having to depend on you know, academic terminologies that are there, which are mostly, you know, written in English. How do you make sure that everybody has a sense of who they are, that it's okay for you to be Zulu, to be Tosa, you know, without modernizing your whole self and putting on a different kind of costume that will then make you fall in within your space where you know for sure that you're homosexual. Can I be a Zulu female being and walk, a, you know, bare-breasted in public, just like Zulu Indians, <coughs> and reclaim my citizenship and my 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 tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, can I be a full Tosa woman and practice traditions that are there to be? You know, so we, we have to like think in so many ways when we're thinking about like what is visibility and what languages do we use and do not only use just one form when we're talking about visibility. Mm -hmm. So I use visuals to write about our immediate spaces, to challenge the status quo. Because when people say, what is a lesbian, what is a homosexual, where do you find these homosexuals, etc., etc. And coming from South Africa, internet is not as fast as here. <laughs> Unlike most gay boys, we don't cruise easily. <laughs> <laughs> and um, maybe the format is easier for the guys because they know exactly what to do. I was saying to someone the other day that, I don't know, we don't have any guidelines on how to make love maybe to women, but as boys, just do it. <laughs> so your gay bars are not my cup of tea. But they are relevant also at the same time because that's where people meet. And I was thinking of how people use letters and telegrams, and now we are at the digital age where we use Twitter, and it's so easy to flirt and move with the flow. We're going to see some in a minute, but I just yeah. want to ask you before you, you move to that, that when you founded the organization, the Forum for the Empowerment of Women, you also made a very specific <coughs> political move to not just put lesbianism on the table, but to name black lesbianism as a space uh, of identity that was under attack in, in a particular kind of way. Uh, and it's that, that organization, the Forum for the Empowerment of Women, and Inkan Yuso, and a few others that you've been involved in, uh, the One in Nine campaign, for example, have to some extent, I think, shattered the idea that uh, the constitutional gains uh, in 1996 in South Africa have been equally enjoyed by all peers in South Africa. Do you want to say something about that before you... Um, before I show the show, yeah. I think I'll, uh, I don't know if, to be fair, maybe to give Cain the chance to respond to the question and then... Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a segue of the digital media uh, generation. I mean, I just came to America a few months back and... Um, you know, um, <clears throat> I've been doing some research with Baltimore gay men. Um, I've been doing a lot of talk with them, especially the black men who are gay in Baltimore. Um, you found out that I did a survey with about 864 black men. And I found out that out of 864 black men, uh, just about 12% um, of them would be representative online. Uh, would show up their profiles on social media. Most of them are anonymous. Most of them want to hide themselves. Now, this is America where there is protection for you. If you're gay, you're not going to be persecuted. But people are still hiding because of what? Now, there is something we call the cultural element to this. And I think no matter what we do, even in the digital space, people are still going to respect culture which is something we need to really talk about as we talk about activism and science and you know, being visible. This is America where there is a lot of freedom, but only 12% black gay men would be representative, would, would, would come online you know, with their real pictures, 
because I've been doing this survey, you know, using all the gay websites and all that. And I found that, that compared to white counterparts, the black gay men in America are still not visible. And this is America. So I think as we talk about Africa, we should also reflect on what's happening here. Uh, look at the, the Black Lives Matters and all of that. I think there's a lot going on with the black man. And we need to contextualize this conversation. Not just about Africa, it's about the culture you know, of shame and silence. Uh, these things that have brought us to this place where we are. So I think these are things I want us to, to look at as we begin to get into this topic. Right, and of course, large, uh, large parts of this country, uh, which not only for black queer people but white queer people as well, don't feel safe. Uh, it seems from reading it from the outside. Um, so, you know, at, in, in Nigeria, for example, do you think that there is more of a, an openness and a possibility of, of talking about? Sexualities in the public sphere, do you think? Nigeria counts as the second uh, yeah. highest homophobic okay. country, uh, according to Pew Research. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Africa, yeah, in Africa, they survey about 45 countries, and Nigeria happens to be the second highest, with about, about 90 something percent who claim that they don't want homosexuals. And remember that when the bill was passed the law, uh, January last year, um, 2014. Um, remember it was a Christmas gift. They said this was a Christmas gift to the nation uh, because the, the people wanted to jail the gay people. Yeah. So it, it, they are excited. You, you remember the story of the thieves on the right side of Jesus and you know, <laughs> and these people were like, this, this, this is sacrifices to be made. And Jesus was part of that. So the homosexuals in Nigeria are the sacrificial lambs, you know, for, for bad <coughs> governors. For, for corrupt, you know, governors and all of that. We are the ones that are the problem, not the terrorists. We are the ones who are the problem, not the people who are stealing the country blind. We are the ones who are the problem because we are homosexuals. So anything wrong with going on, like in America to today, they still talk about it when there's tsunami and people say it's homosexual. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so sometimes I think we... And feminists. Yes. You know. <laughs> so a lot of times, this, this is a universal thing, you know, I... I used to talk about it as African problem until I moved here. But yeah, I used to think there was a lot of problem with us in Africa. But when I got here, you know, I found out that this is a human problem. It's, it's something human about this, where we try to hide behind the mask, you know, and blame other people for whatever predicaments we are right. facing. And is it, do you think that the um, these insights from, from Baltimore that you're talking about are uh, a sign of the, the extent to which young people uh, are feeling as if public spaces are, are spaces in which to be black is to be marked. And so adding another layer to that uh, of, of uh, yeah. an, an identity that is problematic just reinforces their yeah. sense of vulnerability. Yeah, if you've been to Baltimore recently, you see most of the homes are boarded up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the 2015 in America. You see most of the homes are boarded up. I mean, I live right in the community where most of these black people don't have transportation. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a place where we do not have public space, you know, like park, you know, where to play. Mm -hmm. So these kids, they go in, they, they also have coffee. Forget about the coffee that was recently out. They've always been coffee in Baltimore mm -hmm. for, for black kids. You know, I don't want to say for everyone because these are really happening in places where you have this this kid, this black kids. So there are a lot of you know issues going around these people. They don't want to have homosexuality to that. So go to a typical barber's shop, which is one of the places where I conducted my survey. A typical barber's shop, once you come in, you need to take you need to remove your homosexuality before you come in. Mm -hmm. You need to put it at the door. Because this is a black man's space. And as black men, what do we listen to? We listen, we listen to hip hop, we listen to rap music. And all of this, they fetishize you know, the, the black male as that tough, strong. And so anything homosexual you know, makes you look like you're losing the fight against the supremacist. 
you're losing the fight against, you know, so it is a whole lot of complex social problems. And I think the earlier we realize that, you know, we'll be able to address the right thing, we'll be able to leverage the right systems. So it is a cultural problem. It's not just, you know, Nigerian, Kenya, you know, it is, it is a universal problem. It's one of the big uh, problems uh, in, in the post-colonial condition is the extent to which uh, heterosexuality and particularly the, the notion of um, a kind of patriarchal family with a man at the head of the household and women as the, um, the nurturing, caring reproducers of the, the nation uh, remain so central in that post-colonial project. And so, for example, Sanele, your photography uh, completely challenges that kind of virtuous subject, uh, female subject of, of the nation. Right. which is partly why the response is so violent, both the official response as well as the on the ground, in the street, the response to, to black queer women. I think people are taken by surprise when they see a person who is, you know, I try to do away with that with women because people think we're disempowered. Uh, I always use the female body person, being mm -hmm. human being for a reason. Um, when you take on the tools for production and you produce work that then comes to history that challenges everything that is there to be. I, I grew up in a space where men carried cameras and they were capable of shooting. So when I realized that really photography had no gender, I had to do it well. Because if Binyavanga's face is on the wall, maybe shot that image, uh, same like how a guy would take those images, same like a straight person or a gay person could do the same. You know, so I just wanted to make sure that we, we had visuals that spoke to us or that speaks to us currently because I was tired of lack of images that spoke to me as a person who was out and who was living or who is living as a black lesbian. Like I said, I find it a little bit easier for, for gays because like him that I studied and he's doing, he's, he's brave to be doing that and even say, you know, mention the other side of America because for most people that come from home, they want to be in America. They wish to be in America as if we don't have really nothing back at home. So when they hear these words, they'll be so disappointed because somebody <laughs> is stopping us from getting to America without thinking that Americans have their own challenges too, especially black people in this country at the height of racism in America. So I had to work just like any other person, and I have to train people to become photographers. What you had, or what you have in your library at school, was produced maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We need to produce the current that will speak to the future. Mm -hmm. If we talk of like queers in space, it talks about this generation of ours. And then there are queer born priests in South Africa, those who are born in the 90s, whose veneer or way of doing things is different. Mm -hmm. So it means that whatever productions from uh, videos to photographs will always be different than the image that you had, which was produced in the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. and the apartheid South Africa. You know, and most of the work that's been produced uh, of, of black people in Africa was never, you know, documented by us. Mm -hmm. So we have a duty right. or a yeah. responsibility yeah. as human beings yeah. to claim our rights. It means that we need to be relevant. Yes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most artists are not taken serious, and from the funding that came to South Africa, um, I don't remember much that was uh, channeled towards black queer artists. There was a lot of funding that was um, given to Africans to produce, which focuses on HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. which focuses on pride, which focuses on other things. But when you say, talking of South Africa's 21 years of democracy, as I'm seated here, you have less books than books that comes from, from Kenya and other parts, in such a way that there are people from outside who know more of South African queer history than us who mm -hmm. are influencing mm -hmm. people's research, mm -hmm. which pains me the most. That's why I keep on echoing the need for the language to say that 
if we use our own languages, respecting um, <coughs> Anglophone, etc., etc., we'll be moving towards the right direction. Because visibility basically means that people need to be able to read and write and visualize their daily experiences. Right now, we don't have enough queer content that speaks to the Africans in their own languages. I don't know why do people think that we have to write in English, really, in as much as English is important. I'm a Zulu-speaking person. In when you go to Zimbabwe, there are Shona people, there are Ndebele people. And if we were to use those languages, I think we'd be challenging our family members who think that we're adopting this thing from the West. So there's a need to write queer terms, terminologies in our own venue <coughs> to challenge the un-African homosexuality or transgenderism in space. That, that's my frustration. We say photography is universal, but my intentions with photography might not be the same like another queer person who comes from Kenya, another person who comes from Uganda. And it meant that it took me a long period to maneuver the spaces and get it right. Mm -hmm. What you see at museums, at galleries, doesn't speak to many queers. And even the thinking around curators giving us the space to showcase, you have to think that people have their own personal beliefs. Some people pray, I go to church, I'm next to pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and even thinking of like um, the art spaces curated by uh, decent uh, straight people, those curators are risking their jobs because it means that the whole department need to have a long meeting just to negotiate <laughs> whether you need to have black nude, uh, black lesbian images with their naked selves there, you know. <laughs> And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negotiation that is tiring because you're thinking to yourself, when will I ever be free? With the boys, they had Maple Top, who yes. produced amazing yes. photography, yes. where each time I look at those images, when I look at Rotin Faniga yeah. as well, and I wish for two minutes to be gay for the day. <laughs> <laughs> because as a lesbian, I was thinking, showcasing images of black female bodies with their boobs and their butts in ways that I won't be, you know, termed a controversial black lesbian photographer would have been something else. So it has not been easy for me because I had to deal with censorship in every other way. And even from the families that I trusted that they understood the politics of order law, you know, so it has not been an easy journey. We do not have a, like books and images that speaks to us. Accessibility is still a challenge. I've been lucky, but then it has not been an easy journey. I think that's really raising a central uh, sort of firewall in this debate about sexuality is that we've had to encounter this long period of coloniality in which black bodies were written about through a particular gaze. Uh, and to imagine talking about sexuality in a way that dismantles that entire edifice is the task of the moment. And part of it is creating the new archives that you're all involved in doing. Uh, and another part of it is uncovering repressed archives. The archives are, that are only available if you speak a multiplicity of languages, if you have this deep, I would say to whom they're probably cultural knowledge, right? In, in a good way, in the sense of, of knowing what the metaphors and the illusions are in our songs and our poetry and our initi initiation practices and our rites of passage into adulthood. Uh, this, the, these, this knowledge that is, is present within our communities, but which was almost kept separate in order not to be made available for, for these colonial uses uh, is what we, we're now doing, we're building, and I think it's quite exciting. Now, uh, do, you, do you think Zanel is right, that it's easier for, for queer men than for women? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm most certainly right. I mean, it's not, it's not a competition to, to, <laughs> to, to, to reach the... The, 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 
the you know the, the barrier line um 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 and because you have the double whammy of being a woman in the world and, 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 and you know a queer woman and, and there's there's no way to kind of run around that you know uh, all the structural other challenges that, that you know that that that, that faces um but i'm caught very much by this i mean by uh, but Zanel and I spoke a while ago about this thing of the archive, which when she was explaining to me, I kind of was getting it, it was on Skype, and I was like, and I've been downloading what she said, and especially now even the question of, of, Af of, of African languages. Um, you know, like, the state is weak in Africa because the state is fake. It's just no good, it's no one secret. So, so... You know, on one hand, there's all this um, bearing to all these spreads of laws and things. It's not that they did it in a committee meeting, you know, and the, of course it was a cut and paste from the India law. And the British law. You know, all of this happens. But, but the truth is, almost everybody knows, and on the other hand, that it's, a, it's not just a reaction to corru corruption, I agree. It's a visceral reaction to the fact that they know that it itself was illegitimate. Yeah. And that they now don't have a way to even, the control which was tenuous over people's activities, over people's imagination, over people's language too, which is it's a political issue, uh, itself is imploding. <laughs> um, and inside that implosion, there are all these opportunities to create these small possible utopias inside this future. And that's why the idea of starting to build these archives you know, it's 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 riper than ever because people are ready for it beyond understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, um, I almost feel like the contract became you're like at independence. People were like, you know, I don't know what this whole independence thing is because I didn't contract anyway with a colonial master. And like even that guy across from this my country to the other side, I didn't even know of his existence. <laughs> And then you went to school and you're like, oh, that's your cousin from the map. You know, you understand what I'm trying to say. So you're like, okay, you can be my cousin, even though I really don't know you and everything else. And then everyone says, put everything you came with from home in a box, lock that box, and then come and perform Kenyan-ness. Or Zimbabwean-ness. And then I come online and, you know, you find the vice president said something and then you're like, Kenyans, Kenyans, let's protest. And you, you try and imagine what it is. Me, to me, it's just a transaction. We made a deal to figure it out. You're like, okay, you know, we, we, we were given independence. And you're like, okay, let's spend some time figuring this thing out. Yeah? Before we know what questions to ask. And in the last decade and 15 years, most certainly in sometimes extremely violent ways, in many, many eruptive ways, People are now asking, and in a certain sense, of the dead center queers are asking. And one of the reasons that those responses are coming unpreempted is because they know that their thing has gone. It's gone, and and so it's a. It, I find myself here in this kind of crux of a very beautiful moment, and and and, and for me, the front of the beauty becomes work like like Zanella is doing with just no. Question at all. I mean, when I first encountered that work, I was like, it, it's not possible. Um, uh, and it is to make uh, what five years ago I thought was physically impossible to do. And then when you go and look at the photographs, you're like, oh, that just now looks normal. But then the efforts that are being exerted to make sure that, that those archives are there, so. She has dreams on there. You spoke about culture, but what about religion as as part of what repressed what repressed the archive in in Africa? Do you think there's a possibility that we might implicate religion in a much more liberatory project now? <laughs> Is it possible for you to talk about religion without culture? No. Think about it. Um, literature, the movement, um, how literature can, you know, how we have the modern literature Africa. 
you know, we, we remember the Islam movement, you know, when they tried to, to teach people the religion, and then they, they were writing about it. We remember the Christianity, you know, when they, the Christian movement, when they came in, and how they were using their religion to teach us how to read and write. Uh, so today, and this is to the point, the issue of language that we use. I'm always concerned about who's telling the story. Uh, who tells the story controls the language. Yes, so um, if you look at Africa, most of the stories that have been told to us are taken from the Bible, and, and this language is the language of oppressors. Uh, and this is not the language against women. This is a language that says, and God created man in his image. What about women? I mean, the next thing said that God took women out of the man. <laughs> Think about it. See, today, until these things are changed, until these languages, which I don't want to call religion, it is, it is still part of culture that has been a culture that are already outdated. Mm -hmm. But these things are still with us. Go to Africa today in every hotel, in most of Africa, I don't know about your place, you will find a Bible in the hotel. Yeah. You will find small Bibles just by your bedside. Lots of parts of the world. Oh, yeah. it, is, it is amazing. And then here in, in America, most of these Pentecostal churches who are filled here, they now transport you know, yes. all of this yes. energy to yes. Africa. Yes. Now, what we're trying to say is that let's change this language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's tell our stories. And that's why she's doing a road work of, of telling the stories of these women in the language of the people. You know, until the West realizes that we need to give African people the voice to, to even black American people, one of the major problems we are having here is because they are not telling their stories. Yes. You know, I'm in Baltimore, every day I'm trying to capture beautiful stories of, of black men who take their children to school, you know, who play with their children. I'm like, these stories are not told. What, I mean, what we hear are black men who are, being, you know, who are, who are criminals and all of that. I attend a school that is very, you know, you want to say one of the top schools in, in, in America. I almost said in Nigeria. <laughs> okay. And I realized that every time they send us security warnings, they always code it like, oh, there are some black men that are moving around the campus. And I challenged the security, I challenged the school administration. I said, why do you always put the color black in your, in your emails to us? These are storytellers. Every letter, every, every magazine we see, every newspaper we see, are stories that are shaping us. So let's not pour religion into this. It is the stories that have been told over and over again, and that's what she do. We need to change it. Mm -hmm. We need to let our people tell their stories so we can change this language. Mm -hmm. So it's a language of oppression, and religion is just one excuse that we can use. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I think we could, we could talk quite a lot about the examples of the ways in which people are are telling their own stories and fighting attempts by uh, various forces uh, using laws, using the state uh, to, to uh, suppress all forms of identities. Uh, we could tell lots of stories about how uh, the sort of saviour complex uh, is uh, shaping some of the politics. Uh, in Africa, and, and then and how, how people themselves, in fact, are taking politics into their own hands mm -hmm. uh, and stopping bills like the anti-homosexuality bill. Right? Mm -hmm. a, a major example of a, of a successful, thriving civil society inside Uganda uh, that didn't rely on an external saviour. But, but we are running out of time, and I do want to keep some time for uh, questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if we could maybe segue to those questions, though, by showing some of Zanelli's images, all her little documentary first, uh, and then open up for Q&A. So do you want to tell us what we're about to see? Um, what I'm about to see is a documentary in which I collaborated with Human Rights Watch. Um, I work a lot with organizations, even though I'm not like, fixated in one space. Um, it's called We Live in Fear. Uh, we, we published it, or it was released in 2013. Just to give you some glimpse of what exactly I do and how I do it, with who I do it, and when. <laughs> and yeah, just to give some context for those who have not seen my my other side. Yeah. 
Thank you. I will be there. Just please are there. Forever more. There's a special star that shines every evening in your eyes. Special star that shines. It's got kids and lullaby. Special love group, I Good. I'm Zanel Mkholi, reporting live from South Africa. I'm a visual activist. I take photographs. The kind of work that I do is on queer politics, gender politics, politics of race. I'm fascinated by LGBTI individuals in different spaces. I've learned how beautiful this place is, how important our lives are, and why we should preserve a history about our own people, about us. Very, very interesting township. I've done a lot of shots here. I shot the first gay woman here in 2002. I don't even know that they are lesbians who own dogs. This is for the first time that I know. <laughs> <laughs> the light scoot here. Yeah. I'm going to shoot a polar portrait of Dumi in Mohokila. I used to be a hairstylist. <laughs> Yeah, we had a life before we came out. <laughs> Somebody asked me how influential am I when it comes to this portrait. And I said to people, I just want people to look good. I really, really want people to be fresh. We're going to the Bobo Pride. We're connected by photography. I was doing photo shoot here in Guatemala. And I thought that she was just... A very nice person to be in the Faces and Faces series I'm working on. You have young generation that is growing up now who doesn't share maybe the same, you know, commonalities like lesbians who, who were out there in the 90s or late 80s before South Africa gained independence. The young lesbians now, they are socialites connected by the social medias and all of that and they're free when it comes to photographs, etc., etc. I know maybe some people get surprised when you start photographing. I was surprised, That's... but the first time it was fun. I had fun and I didn't know that I'm such a genie. I like to take myself. Mm. So this is three years later. We are in the same township and the township is so popular with um, with uh, <laughs> no gay lives, there are a lot of gay people in Guatemala, <laughs> and also it has since become notorious for hate crimes because in 2008, a non-bent lesbian was brutally murdered here. 2012 was one of the most painful years in our history. We lost a lot of uh, members of our communities, and hate crimes specifically, curative rapes and, and lesbian murders became one of the of the brutality that is stained in our brains forever. We live in fear. Death happened to bind us. Hate crimes have become a binding factor for the LGBTI communities. We come together to either give support or to confirm that somebody has been killed. Then that person becomes a statistic another case number becomes part of our history. And what are we doing about it? Do we always go and attend funerals and then after funerals you go home, we wait for another funeral? What? You have to document. You are forced to document. Transformation. I don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> Transformation by Zanila <laughs> By you, this is your age. Our is a way of creating awareness, capturing the moments, those truths and realities that the world will learn about our cultures. I could give you something tangible and say, feel it, this is it, see. You invited to be in that space, even though you were not there. Well, please put it in and out. We're shooting faces and faces, not fashion. <laughs> <laughs> There is the other side of me when I perform. There is the other side of me when I'm me. How will you engage with me?
looks okay, yeah. <laughs> that I know. They are no strangers to me. I call the people who are in my photographs participants because you partake in a project that will inform many audiences. And I comes to these teaching. Any person who is interested in learning is welcome to learn how to take photographs. I provide cameras as long as a person will be able to document what will then become a contribution to what Singanyeso, which is the organization that I formed. One cannot do these major projects alone, which is why I invited people to come on board and work with me. And it means that it's not lonely anymore. Take what? <laughs> I started this project called Singanyeso to ensure that uh, people who are featuring in my photographs get a platform to share their own lives and work. People get to read about sex, people get to read about anything that they will never, in as much as South Africa is so democratic, they'll never see that kind of text in the mainstream media. Most of the team members, we are black lesbians. People occupy a different position within the Ganyiso crew. Book is a documenter, and Lilata is a graduate, she's a journalist, and we just posted a new story on Pep Smear <laughs> that, that she, she wrote this morning. Now I had to beg Lilata to cut that hair, and look how beautiful this person is. It is Lilata's portrait in 2010, so we're gonna have a nice follow-up shot. I train and I will continue to train with or without funding. Because if I wait for someone to validate my existence, it will mean that I'm shortchanging myself. Mm. Recently, we had to decide whether we buy a fridge where we live or we buy a new lens. Mm. Huh. So we sleep on the floor. It's nice. Documenting with my crew. It's fabulous. I like the people <coughs> that I work with. A lot of people are reading this perhaps me thing for being lady and even butch women. It's something that's sick, if I don't know if I can say taboo. But I don't know, you said you need me to revise it. No, you have to do part two. Part two, what's part I two? Think that you be the I don't think that you gave it to your own, like how you write when you tackle the issue of hate crimes. And yeah. uh, what would you like to read about in the mainstream? You not even read, even when seeing, you know, I'd like to see an advert of a family where it's the mother and the mother and the baby, you know, and they're fighting gems in the household, <laughs> about the violence and the homophobia. We want to bring about changing spaces that are queerphobic. We still have religious leaders who want to use homosexuality as scapegoat for their own hate. Instead of dealing with poverty, instead of dealing with the corrupted systems that we find ourselves in, and that's what leads to many hate crimes. See where there's white congo to work? is where Nukolo Nukwaza was found. Nukolo Nukwaza is a victim of hate crime who was brutally murdered. Her head was crushed with a big stone. Her teeth were all over the place. Nukolo Nukwaza's children are not the first to be offended by hate crimes. What would people say to the children what happened to their mothers? Nukolo's case is still outstanding. I don't know how far do they, they investigate these cases. <sighs> We all document that this and Finera. Every person who has a cell phone with a camera, it doesn't matter what quality. And all of us come together in one space and download and share. You make that document viral. We want to say to our government, this is what I'm talking about when I talk of a Lisbon Finera. It's my wish that we could find positive Lisbon icons on Wikipedia as well, other than to always find brutal murders. You Google black Lisbon in South Africa, you see what you see there. There is nothing that focuses on same-sex love versus these hate crimes. When do we start talking about intimacy? I, I produce pictures that are intimate because I'm an intimate being. This intimacy that disrupts the perpetrator leads to us being killed. It starts by the same sex love that is disorganizing the mindset of the homophobe. More education is needed. Mainstream communities 
need to come on board and help us and ensure that there's no other hate crime. Projecting positivity sometimes can lead to the change. Projecting brutality and violations could lead to further violence. So I think that we need to find a balance in which mm. we project these realities. <laughs> I came with the Ganesha crew last night. Once we're done here, we're going to put it up on social networks to make sure that people might not be here to understand what is taking place and get the visuals. People think that pink cities are Cape Town, Deben, and Johannesburg. People cannot even imagine that they can go to it's very important for us to say that LGBTI individuals are all over. Any space is possible. So we're here to celebrate with the people of this province. It's about saying, I want to be counted in South African history. Claiming my full citizenship, it means that I have to write the part of history. My name is Jim Porat. Um, those are such beautiful images. I, I just am blown away by the beauty of, the, of people, just people, our people. My question has to do with gender performance, identity, and authenticity. With social media being what it is, is this a new form of colonialization about how we're supposed to look no matter where we are, but in, within Africa? Uh, is are they taking on an image of homosexuality that they see, or is it something authentic in their own native or country tradition? Yeah, I mean, that's, if you look at the mobile penetration in Africa, especially right now that everybody has a mobile phone, um, I think it's about 60-something percent from the last count. Uh, you discover that there is the whole lot we can do with social media. Um, I use the space of social media to engage with people because uh, people don't really buy magazines and the books that we read, uh, but people can move things around to talk about their identity and all of that. It is, I think it's a welcome thing, it's a, it's a good thing, um, because now people are telling their own stories uh, without being forced to listen to um, one uh, single story like Sh Shimamanda say about the danger of single story. Um, I think it's something we should celebrate, uh, that the social media, the digital social media is creating a space where we can have this new queer voice, identity, and people have that space without being edited, you know. Uh, because a lot of time what you want to say, you can't say it when people have to uh, censor what you have to say. But with mobile phones in people's hands, they can talk about who they are and they can pass it on. And I think that's what's causing a lot of revolution, even here in America. You know, so um, if, I, if, if I get your question right, I think it's something we need to celebrate. Rather than looking at it as another set of wave or something that's just happening. It's not a sensation. It is necessary that people tell their own story. And I am for that. Yeah. performances of queerness, are they new indigenous forms of which this is? Now, the point of all it is, we have to just come back to the simple question that the first thing to say is people have been living in, in Africa for 200,000 years, as we <laughs> see, in every manner of human ways of arranging themselves uh, as possible. And so, 
No, there is no way to answer your question because <laughs> uh, uh, you understand what I'm trying to mean. Because the question also wants to colonize it into that idea. It can't be. You know, you can say the glimpses. Where well, Zanella glimpses, the piece of pieces of the game, I can talk about the balcony of such and such, <laughs> but I I can't know. Um, I, I think this, the, the, and again, coming even back again to the question of um, uh, the, whatever the problems about the ownership of Twitter and what, which political party they belong to, and who, you know, how uh, uh, Microsoft or somebody else or Citibank we shall try and own each and every person and, and all of that. Um, <laughs> at the same time, we also have Black Lives Matters. So I think um, these are platforms. Uh, they're not in themselves revolutions. Um, but I'm very, very interested in the idea of the, of, of the power of a black person in this world. Um, and so where people are rushing and gushing through this to vault themselves into a place of power, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know about gender relativity. I, I don't know, it just disturbs me. But then I always think of before anything becomes performativity, before it's gendered, before it has a name and label, there's a human being, which is me, before that loads, before any performance takes mm -hmm. place. There's a somebody inside me before anything else. And then I say maybe people have been there before people did not have the names, especially African people, where maybe I, I don't like to quote people when I talk, but I do it this time. Like Judith Butler is not my reality in that way because African people have their own names and naming and where we use all our histories and express ourselves before the academic terms. And, and, and bombastics mm -hmm. that we force to understand our gender and sexualities by referencing those experts. Mm -hmm. We have our own organic intellectuals that existed for so many years. Before performativity, before the costume, mm -hmm. before anything else, the human being in you, in me, is queer. Authentic. Yes. <laughs> so, in terms of the human... Oh, sorry, I'm Musaya Ufano, I'm from Nigeria. Um, so this question might be very Nigerian-specific, and I apologize, because I always try to make things as specific as possible when I talk about Africa, because they are just a multitude of cultures, and I think one mistake we make is we conflate them all. So I apologize that this question might be just directed to Kainde. So when she um, asked about religion, you said that religion is part of culture, and and maybe dismissed it a little bit, I think, because, and I think in the case of Nigeria, it's actually a very dangerous thing to do because there's sort of a charismatic Christianity in Nigeria, a charismatic Pentecostalism that I don't think has been received from Americans. I think it's actually quite within at least Yoruba culture. We are very, very, very Christian. So in terms of making the lives of queers in Nigeria better, is it impossible to, you have to engage religion? And, and is there a, a, a possibility of queer Nigerians and queer activists in Nigeria engaging with themes of Christianity, because I think in order to advance the, the, the queer Nigerian project, you can't dismiss Christianity, because at the end of the day, most, at least Nigerian Christians are very, very Christian, and they're a huge percentage of the population. And I think even if you want to include Islam in that, you, you cannot dismiss Western faiths, because at the end of the day, the percentage of people who practice traditional you know, Yoruba belief is quite small. And I come from someone, with my father is someone who's quite an expert in it, but it's a very small amount of people. So can you just talk a little bit about how perhaps we can engage with things in these books to actually improve the individual lives of queer people? Because I think there's a lot in that book that could actually further that project. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm writing the book, uh, which is my memoir that captures my journey as a preacher boy. Um, I used to preach, I was from, with Foursquare Gospel Church. Uh, which very, used to be very big here in America. And uh, we used to have a lot of you know, revival meetings, raising the dead, healing people. Uh, I can't tell you how many dead we raised. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but don't ask me. <laughs> um, I, I want to say that there, there are some activists in Nigeria who have pioneered you know, uh, the, the engagement with fake people, like Gideon Macaulay. 
Uh, this is someone I look up to. He has done a lot of work trying to. But if you look at the way our belief system is, you know, and that's why you thought I was dismissed, you know, dismiss everybody. Um, we are very fanatic when we take on something. Uh, look at fashion, for instance. When fashion comes to Nigeria, we take it to the next level. <laughs> go, go, go ask anybody. Go ask anybody. Education, the same thing. Nigerians, when they get into education, they go to the far end of it. Um, anything we do, we go to the far end of it. We just are a little bit intense. Uh, Nigerian people here, hello. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's why you find Nigeria everywhere on here. You can find it anywhere, you know. Um, so what, you need to, what we need to do is to begin to engage, you know, uh, this religious leader. But unfortunately, these people are not going to just engage with us. Because they have, I don't want to use the word fanatics, uh, they would not listen to you. Didier Macaulay was persecuted, he had to flee. Uh, he had to leave the country because nobody was going to, in fact, he was, he was, being, he was facing death threats because he was preaching and was using Jesus. You know, and people thought as homosexual, why would you mention the word Jesus? Um, in, in January this year, when I wrote my story about how I came out, I ended with the book of Romans, and I quoted the book of Romans that what shall separate us from the love of God. Yes, yes, um, and it is a truth, I mean, because the love of God is for all his uh, children. Uh, that if God is a man, because they made us to believe he's a man. Right. Um, <laughs> for, most, for most people who came at me on that post that went viral in Nigeria and most part of Africa, the reason why they were fighting that post was not because I came out as gay, it was because I quoted the Bible. That's bizarre. They were like, why would you quote the Bible? You are gay. Gay people are not gay. You should quote the Bible. It is an abomination in itself that you are using the Bible. So when you look at this, you begin to ask yourself, where do we start this conversation? I used to be very anti-religion when I came out from religion because religion was very destructive to me. I was with it, I was in it, I did everything. But when I look at it, when I first came out, you know, there's a time in your life as an activist when you want to really fight. You know, I came out, I would, I would write anything against religion. I would just say, but later when I realized we needed to build some empathy with these people, so I started getting to be gentle, and, but even at that, it didn't work. People still, you know, people are still going to come at you and say, you're going to hell because you're, you're gay. Or you're, so I don't know what to do. I think it's a complex issue. And if we're going to start that, Nigeria loves money. Get these people, these pastors, to New York for a meeting. And fly them in, have a conference with them.